Hey, if you come to the crossing, you learn things, all right? Um, I, I just got to ask, how many of you disagree with that? How many of you think it goes under the roll? Let's see the hands. It goes under the roll. Okay. Well, let me just tell you, our crack research staff, also, also known as Chad Balzer, actually went back and did some research, and the person who actually invented the toilet paper roll, here's the patent, is in September 15th, 1891, it's supposed to go over. So the inventor believes it's supposed to go over. However, however, because we are a messed up church for messed up people, those who go under, you're still welcome here, all right? So that's perfectly fine, not a problem. Uh, seriously, we are in a brand new series called Leave It Better, and a lot of times people ask, they're like, hey, how do you guys come up with stuff like that? How do you come up with The Greatest Showman and different series? And, and to be honest, it's, it's a lot of different ways. Our staff, uh, usually Jay, Jai, Robert, and I, will get together, kind of rhyme, uh, we get together and we kind of plan the things out for uh, the upcoming year. Sometimes it's something that we've all come up with, sometimes it's just an idea, and, I, and the series that we're, we're doing uh, over the next few weeks called Leave It Better uh, actually came from a book that I was reading by Erwin McManus called The Last Arrow, and I didn't have to get very far into this book to realize, you know what, there's so much truth already in this, and it just kind of triggered the whole idea of leaving it better. You see, uh, Erwin had a stepfather, and, and to him, he was his dad. He's all he ever knew was Bill, and there was a lot of tension in that relationship. I mean, to the outsider looking in, he seemed gregarious, outgoing, and great, but there was a lot of tension, and as uh, as Erwin grew a little older, his two sisters, there was a lot of conflict, and one day uh, Bill decided he was leaving, he was gone, and so Erwin talks about this, that, that he basically goes out, his sister's like, go stop him, you gotta stop him, so Erwin goes out to kinda try to stop him, but quite honestly, he didn't really want to stop him, he's like, you know what, I want him to go. But he went out there, and as he's like standing kind of in front of the car, he says, Bill and he lock eyes, and Bill steps on it and kind of swerves to the right and, and kind of clips him and takes off. And, and so basically from that point on, Bill really wasn't in his life. Bill ended up getting remarried, and uh, Erwin got married and had a son. And, and I kind of want to pick up, and I don't normally read from a book, but I kind of want to use Erwin's words um, about his son, Aaron. He says, when Aaron was 15... He wanted to meet the man who gave me that name in the first place, the man I called my father. I felt I owed him that, so even though I hadn't spoken to my dad in 15 years, I tracked him down as if he were a stranger I was trying to meet for the very first time. We found him in a small town outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, a town called Matthews. He was more than happy to see me and more than happy to meet my son. I think I'd caused him great sadness by extricating myself from his life for the past 15 years. I didn't know what to expect, but the reunion went well enough for a while. And then there were the last words I heard him say as we were leaving. Not just the last words that day, but forever as he died not too long afterward. He said to my son, in my presence, I don't know what your dad has told you, but he was average. He was just average. His brother was exceptional, but your dad, he was just average. Those words cut me like a knife. Please don't misunderstand me. What hurt me most was not that those were the last words my father chose to say about me, nor was I most hurt because my son heard his judgment. What cut me deepest was a terrifying sense that Bill McManus was right, that I was just average. Frankly, if you look back at my early life, those words would have, would have to be categorized as an exaggeration towards the positive. Because I was, in fact, always below average. I wasn't the C student. I was the D student. I wasn't second string. I was at best third string. The painful truth is that average had actually always eluded me. I seemed to be always diving towards the bottom. I was never picked first, nor second, nor anywhere in the middle. I was always literally the last player picked. And while I always hoped that one day there would be something special about me, the truth is I made my home in the average, if not below average. I found a strange solace and safety in my power of invisibility and made my obscurity my residence. I'm in no small part indebted to that, indebted to that conversation with Bill for all the thoughts that follow in this book. I do not believe anything is born average, but I do believe that many of us choose to live a life of mediocrity. I think there are more of us than not who we are 
in danger of disappearing into the abyss of the ordinary. The great tragedy in this, of course, is that there is nothing really ordinary about us. We might not be convinced of this, but our souls already know it's true, which is why we find ourselves tormented when we choose lives beneath our capacities and our callings. You know, that, that really stung me and that really stuck with me because the reality is I think all of us, if we were honest, probably are more comfortable just being average. Just being average. And what Irwin says in this book, The Last Arrow, is that we have to refuse to be average. He says we must war against the temptation to settle for less. Average is always a safe choice, and it is the most dangerous choice we can make. Average protects us from the risk of failure, and it also separates us from the futures of greatness. I don't know about you, but there are times that I actually start to reflect on this question. How do I want to be remembered? When people remember me, what is it that they're going to remember about me? And are they going to remember me as someone as I don't care? He was average. He was absolutely average. How do you want to be remembered? You see, the reality is when it comes to our impact in, in those around us, or the, the world around us, or the community around us, I, I think the reality is, I don't think any of us would say, you know, I feel really good about the state of our country right now. I feel like things are really humming along. They're great. I don't think anybody would say, you know what, I really like where this world is right now. I, I, you know what, I feel really satisfied that the schools and the community that I live in right now are just, man, they are great. I feel satisfied about that. You know, the church, whether it be the local church you're attending here or the local church you're attending somewhere else, or the, local, local, or the global church, I don't know if we could really say that it's exceeding, that it's really doing well, or the church has never been better. And what about your family? Is it exceeding your expectations? Can you say it could never get better? You see, if we were honest with ourselves, really honest with ourselves, I, I, I think we would probably agree that the world could be better. The region, the community, the schools we live in could be better. Our church could be better. Our families, our marriages could be better. But the question is, are we willing to do what it takes to leave it better? Or are we going to just be comfortable when it comes to mediocrity and live the status quo and just be average? You see, as followers of Jesus, and I realize not everybody in here is a follower of Jesus, but if you are someone who is a follower of Jesus, then it is our life mission, it is the expectation for us to leave the things that we come in contact with better. Because I think, at least I hope the answer to this question is, when Jesus found you, he has certainly left you better. He's left you better. So how in the world can we have an encounter with the, the life transformation go from being utterly lost to hopefully forever found? How can that not change us? How can we be okay with just being average? How can we just settle in and be okay with that? Every day, average. Everywhere we go, average. Everybody we touch, average. How can we do that and have a relationship with Jesus Christ? And so I, I, I kind of want to look at some passages of Scripture this morning. And I'm going to start off first with Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And, and some of you will recognize this maybe from the NIV. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it as a paraphrase from the message. And, and this is what Paul is writing to the Romans. He says this. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. I don't think he wants an average one. And I don't think he'll settle for below average. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you could do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. And you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best of you. He develops and matures you. So how can we have God in our life and just be okay with average? 
You see, Romans 12 tells us we can't conform to the patterns of this world. Instead, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We should be different because we have a relationship with him. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 12 says this, but you are not like that. And what he's saying there is you're not like that. Well, what is like that? Well, if you have to go to verse one of this chapter where he's saying that you, know, you need to get rid of all your evil behavior, be done with all the deceit, all the hypocrisy, jealousy, and all the unkind speech. In other words, you are now not like that. You don't do that anymore. Here's what you do. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. So therefore, as a result of that, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. You see, once you had no identity as people, now your identity is God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. You see, we live so differently that even I find that last line so fascinating that even though people might not agree with us, even though they may not believe, but if we live our lives so differently that they will actually give honor to God by us being different. Not by us being average, but by us being different. And so we need to stand out. We need to be above average. We, this mediocre mindset of just kind of cruising and humming along and being okay with okay, that's just not Okay. See, Jesus actually tells us how we're to live. In Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16, and this is a very familiar passage for many of you, especially if you grew up in the church, because as I start to read this, you're gonna start humming, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. You're gonna remember this, right? But this is what he says, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Now, when he says this, he says this in what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And during the Sermon on the Mount, he says a lot. He does a lot of things. But I think because we're so stuck on that little song that that we tend to think it's like a standalone message. You know, it's like this is week two of my sermon series. Come back next week as we bring some more sermon material. The the Sermon on the Mount is, is, we, we tend to compartmentalize as if it just stands alone. But I want you to know it doesn't stand alone. It actually follows on the heels of something. He doesn't say, come back next week as we conclude and and go into it here's what he just got done saying here's what he just got done saying and he doesn't put this big pause in between it he says in verse 10 and 12 God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right for the kingdom of heaven is theirs God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sort of evil things against you because you are my followers be happy about it be very glad for great For a great reward awaits you in heaven, and remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. So he just got done saying, people are going to mock you, people are going to make fun of you, people are going to persecute you, they're going to try to, they may disown you, they may try to silence you, they may try to threaten you, And, and, and don't forget, there were other people that came long before you who also suffered persecutions. And so what does Jesus say right after he gets done talking about this persecution that you will experience if you're a follower of mine? What does he say? Does he say run for the hills? Create this subculture where it's safe? Wrap yourself in bubble wrap so that nobody bothers you? Create, you know, go go do this. Separate yourself from the world. Create this safe environment that we all feel good and comfortable. Is that what he says? No, here's what he says. You stand out. You stand up. And you stand out. He doesn't say run and hide. He just got done saying anybody that's a follower of mine will be persecuted. And here's what I want you to do. If you're a follower of mine, here's what I want you to do about that. Is you stand up. You bring out the salt seasoning of God. Because if you lose your saltiness, how will the people taste God's goodness? 
So after talking about persecution and insults, he doesn't say run away. He says do the opposite. Stand out. You want to make a difference? You want to be above average? You want to leave the community better? Then stand out. Stand out in your schools. Stand out in your homes. Stand out in your community. Stand out. Be distinctive. Be different. And the way we do that, he says in this passage, is we got to be saltier and we got to be brighter because the world is dark. So here's two analogies that he uses. He talks about light and salt. And the first one is, is kind of basic. Salt is a preservative. You see, in the ancient times, we, we, they, they would use it to keep their meat from spoiling or, or rotting or becoming no good. And so you would sprinkle salt on it because that would preserve it. It would keep it longer. It would make it better rather than going bad. You see, salt was the refrigerator of that time. Salt was the freezer of that time. And when we represent Jesus, we are to make a difference to where we make things better. There's a lot of rot going on in this world. There's a lot of decay going on in this world. There's a lot of illness. And I'm not just talking about physical illness. I'm talking about spiritual illness. And we are to be salt. We are to, to put a stop to that. We are to, put, to halt the progress of the decay that is going on in our culture. And Christ expects us to be salt to keep the rot away. Salt also makes things better. And we know that. I mean, we all know that McDonald's french fries are the best. And if you're like, you know, or, or even Five Guys fries are really good. Or, you know, even Penn Station fries are really good. And I know right now I'm going to lose some of you for the rest of this message because you're like, I got to have that. But the reality is, is I could get out those fries and set them there and blindfold you and then bring out the old, warm, crinkly, soggy ones that you used to have in cafeteria food in the fifth grade. Remember what I'm talking about where it was, the French fries were like limp and, and, and just soggy and not really salty. I mean, if, I blind ta- if you blind taste as I guarantee you would be able to pick out the McDonald's fries just like that. Because salt, in this case, makes it better. Anybody ever had an unsalted peanut or an unsalted potato chip? The entire time you're eating that one unsalted peanut or that one unsalted potato chip, you're thinking, why am I bothering? It is not worth it. This is a waste of time. It's not the same. You see, as disciples, we, we as followers of Jesus, we are to leave it better. And, and people ought to be able to do a blind taste test, so to speak, that when they see us, we stand out. And when we walk into a room, whether it be our classroom or on our sports teams, or the drama club, or when we walk into the cubicle at our workplace, we should make it better. People should sense that there is something distinctive, something different, and something better about us. And if we are going to be Christ followers, then he tells us, don't run and hide. You be a change agent. Be different. Make it better. You see, in the early centuries, and I know this isn't culturally correct now, and it's hard for us to even wrap our minds around it, but yes, Christ followers, believers way back when had slaves. They had servants. But I'll tell you this, while we would never approve that or endorse that in 2019, the reality is that was their culture. But those slave owners treated them better. Christ followers treated them better because neither slave nor free, Jew, Gentile, male or female, the ground was level at the foot of the cross and we're gonna treat them like human beings. We're gonna treat them like children of God. You see, even the slave owners in the early, early first century church, they treated them better. They treated their women better. They treated people better. You know, it's well known, well documented that they were more generous. They shared everything that they had in common. If there was a need, they would rise up and they would share it. It's also very well known that when the plagues were spreading across Europe in the third century, it was Christ followers, it was disciples who stood there and continued to take care of them when other people would take their loved ones and just throw them out or, or get away from them. And this isn't, this isn't, this is historians that have nothing, no skin in the game. Historians that were not Christ followers have said this. That the Christians stayed. They touched the untouchable. And many of them, even though they were being salt, it did not make them immune. They died. 
They died taking care of people when many other people fled. You see, they were salt. They made it better. And they also knew that to live is Christ. And therefore in Christ, to die is gain. Salt preserves rot. It makes things better. And today our world is dealing with, and our communities are dealing with, and our families are dealing with a lot of things that are plaguing us, a lot of hopelessness, a lot of evil, a lot of desperation. And Jesus expects us to be salt so that instead they see hope. He doesn't want us to be tucked away, safe and comfortable in our sterilized, sanitized, self-centerized fallout shelters. He wants us to stand out. He wants us to be effective. And for salt to be effective, it actually has to be applied. It can't stay safely in the salt shaker. It's not going to do your fries any good in the salt shaker. It's not going to do the rotting, decaying meat any good in the salt shaker. And, and I really believe, quite honestly, we can come in here and we can be comfortable for a little while within these walls and, and feel like, yeah, praise Jesus, love Jesus, worship Jesus, and, and feel good and feel all right about it, feel safe about it. But if we don't walk out those doors and be distinctive and make a difference, then we are fooling ourselves. Because he wants us to be different. He wants us to stand out. And so we have to go out. We have to be involved. We have to. Did you notice the early passage says, when you were among the unbelievers? He didn't say separate yourself from the unbelievers. He just said when you're with them, don't conform. But he didn't say stay away from them because he wants us to make a difference. He wants us to change people. And we cannot influence others if we have no relationship with them. Someone said as Christ ambassadors, we need to be willing to leave the embassy. Someone else said, well, Jesus said this, a little bit more direct, in Luke 14, verse 34 through 35. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? These are Jesus' words, verse 35. Flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown away. So what Jesus is basically saying there, if I could really cut to the quick, is Jesus says if you lose your saltiness, you are not worth the manure pile. You're not worth it. You're useless. It's useless. You're not doing what I've called you to do, what I've equipped you to do, what I saved you to do. And that's to make a difference. Salt is useless if it's not salty. It's in our DNA that once we accept Jesus, we have to make a difference. It's in our DNA. So if you're a barista, if you're a coach, if you're a photographer, if you're a teacher, if you're a student in school, if you have a relationship with Christ and you are not making a difference, you're just okay with status quo, hiding, creating your own little subculture where you feel safe and comfy. If you are not making a difference, then Jesus says you're not worth the manure pile. We're useless. Useless. And God has called every single Christ follower to be a change agent in this world. And that's what we have to do if we want to leave it better. Otherwise, we're of no use. He also says we are to be light. Matthew 5, 14, 16. Again, you're the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it on their basket. Instead, they place the lamp someplace where it gives light to the entire house. And in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. See, during the time when Jesus said that, there was a city called Safed where it was a city on a hill. And so everybody knew what he was referring to because at night they could all see the lights up on that hill. And they knew, hey, I could see where that city is because we could see the lights. Now, in our day and age, we have lights everywhere. So I tried to think of an analogy. And, and for me, the only analogy I could think of is back in the, in the, in the mid-70s when King's Island opened up, that Eiffel Tower was our light. <laughs> 
you know. Back then in the 70s, I, I lived, uh, we, we lived in Bethel, my mom and, and, and our bo- the boys and our cousins, and so we would always make that day's journey to Kings Island uh, because it did not have 275 at that time. So you had to really pack a lunch and make the day's journey on the horse and carriage all the way around and up. But when you would come up 71, you would see the Eiffel Tower, and whenever you'd see the Eiffel Tower and you'd see it from a distance away, we boys would get so excited, we'd start singing, dun, 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 and we were pumped and we were excited because Kings Island is close. We can see the Eiffel Tower. And then when we'd get in the, into the park, the interesting thing is that thing was so huge that you could see the Eiffel Tower from wherever you were in the park. And so my mom and Aunt Margie came up with something I thought was brilliant, very creative. Probably no other family's ever thought of this. And that is meet us every few hours under the Eiffel Tower because we know you can find it. And so if you've never done that, I want to tell you that you're getting that from me right here. Try it. Because you can see it everywhere. Matter of fact, there's a photo, I think, of our family under the Eiffel Tower. There it is. So anyway, no, that's not really us. Uh, But that's the Brady Bunch for you kids that are under 35, all right? So, um, but the thing is, is it was brilliant because you could see it everywhere you went. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. We need to be seen. We need to be seen. Light simply Brightens the room. It makes it, it makes it brighter. It makes it better. I mean, when we were selling our house, our realtor, Taylor, said, you got to brighten this up. you got to bring open the blinds. you got to turn on every light in the house and make it look bright. Don't make it look dank and dark and creepy. Brighten it up. And if you watch anybody on these shows, you know, the, the home flipper shows or the staging shows or whatever, you know that's what they say is lighten it up, brighten it up, put some cookies in and bake them and make it feel warm and comfy. Now, I don't know if that's what Jesus was thinking. I don't know if Jesus was saying when you put a light, you put it on a lamp and you light up that room and bake some cookies because it will stand out and sell your house faster. I don't think that's what he's talking about. But what I think he is talking about is you are the light of the world, a city on a hill, so world, hill, in a room. Notice how it gets smaller and smaller. But when you are in that room, you're going to light, you're going to be lit, so to speak. I don't know if that's appropriate or not. Um, I, you get the point, all right? You will, you will make the room better. You will make it better. Some of you don't quote me on that. The priest said, go get lit, all right? But you turn on the light, you illuminate and you eliminate the darkness. And the question I have to ask you is, do you take the light of Christ with you or when you walk in the room, does it get dark real fast? Are you Mr. Doom and Gloom who happens to be telling everybody you're a Christ follower but they can't seem to see the difference. Ephesians 5, Paul writes this in verse 8. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of the light. For this light within you produces only what is good, what is right, and what is true. This world is producing a lot that is wrong, a lot that is bad, and a lot that's lies. If you want to be distinctive, you want to make a difference, then you carry the light of God, the light of Christ into a room because what God is, is good and right and true. And I don't know about you, but if we want to just coast along and be average, we can continue to watch this world be bad, wrong, and full of lies. So are you leaving your home, are you leaving your work, are you leaving your community gathering places better or brighter? Lights also help us navigate in the darkness, whether it's a flashlight, candlelight, or a nightlight. If you've ever moved furniture around and forgot you moved furniture around, then got up and tried to walk that room in the dark, you've probably stubbed a toe or two. So you put night lights out or something so you could have that space illuminated at least so you can find your way to get a drink or to go to the bathroom or whatever. Philippians says, Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. You see, we need to light up the darkness so that he shines through us. Lights also warn us of danger. You know, there are many kinds of lights and beacons, and we don't, we don't really see the lighthouse as being something very important to us anymore. Matter of fact, with technology and GPS, even the lighthouses are kind of becoming extinct in their importance. But it was to rescue, it was to warn ships that they were getting close to shore or close to the rocks. And we've seen other things that 
flashing lights on radio towers, I'm assuming, to warn planes that there's something here at this altitude. You know, I was noticing, and, and I know a lot of you, if you lived around this area, you know that on State, one, uh, State Route 132 in Chapel, for the longest time, that was not a four-way stop. You just cruised through 132 and you just went. Well, the problem was there were a lot of people who were cruising through Chapel. And I'm very aware of it because when I was bailiffing, I, I was a part of a very sad trial where someone who was, was being charged because she blew through Chapel and blindsided someone and killed them. And so I guess after enough people were killed, that the state decided to put a four-way stop there. And just so that you would know, they put stop signs that have LEDs or solar panels so that they could be uh, charged or be lit by the power from the sun. And now they have flashers. We have them down here at the bottom of the hill. They're flashing red lights to warn you that you better stop. You better stop. And and I believe that that is what light is supposed to be, is light is supposed to be a warning to those around us that they better stop. They better stop. Better stop going your way. And I'm warning you, you need to turn to Jesus. So as I wrap up this, I want you to notice one other thing about this familiar text. And like I said before, if you sang this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. If you did that, you probably stop there. And that's all you think about is the light and the salt and all that. But there's a last word he says, or the last sentence in verse 16, Jesus says this. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. And I want you to notice these words, and go ahead and leave them up there for a little bit, because I want you to notice this. Let your good deeds shine for all to see. It does not say, let your choice words shine for all to hear. You see, Jesus seemed to have his eyes not only in the first century audience, but on the 2019 audience as well. Because we're really good at tweeting or chiming in with our words all the time. We're really good about calling talk radio or whatever in order to give people our opinions and our words all the time. But here's the point. If you want to make an impact in this world today, you need to stop talking and start showing. We need to stop talking. The world doesn't want to hear our voices right now because what we've been saying hasn't been aligning with how we've been living. We can talk all we want, but if they're not seeing a difference, if we're not distinctive, if we're not standing out, it is useless. It's not worth the the manure pile. What this world needs right now is to see the light of Christ in our actions and in our behaviors, not hear about it through our words, because talk is cheap. And we need this church, and right now I'm gonna shrink it down to this local church. So if you're in here right now, I'm talking to you. We need to be the light in this community where they see our actions, not hear our words. Because they're tired of listening. Because what they're hearing and what they're seeing are not the same. And we've lost our voice. We've lost our voice in this culture due to scandal, due to misconduct, due to skepticism and mistrust. We've lost it. And the only way the church is going to have an impact in the community or the region or the world again is if we shut up and start showing it. It's the only way we'll ever get our voice back is if they can see our good deeds and therefore attribute our good deeds and give credit to him because it is the light of the world that we're trying to show and we know the light of the world is him. And look at what it says in 1 John, and this is the message again. This, in essence, is the message we heard from Christ and are passing on to you. God is light, pure light. There's not a trace of darkness in him. And if we claim that we experience a shared life with him and yet continue to stumble around in the dark, then we're obviously lying through our teeth. We're not living what we claim. So what Jesus says is let your good deeds shine out for all to see because actions don't lie. And so we have to stand out. And there's a lot of people who are so-called Christians who are stumbling around in the dark, 
giving Christ a bad name, a bad reputation, and to be honest, are deflecting people from the real light because their words and their deeds are not matching. So in order for them to hear us again, we need to show them the light. We need to show them the light and stop talking about it. So the question I'd ask is, are you, if you are a Christ follower, are you still salty? Or have you, start to, have you started to lose your saltiness? And is your light shining? Or is it just blending in with the rest of the culture? You see, the answer to that question for you and him should be a little frightening. Because it's going to be between you and him and how you answer that. And it's going to be between you and him or whether you're useful or useless. So how can we leave the community better? I ask this question all the time as a leader of the crossing. And again, if you're visiting from another church, you can ask this question about the church you're a part of. But if this church no longer existed, would this community even miss us? Would they even notice we're gone? And when I say this church, if you're sitting in this room right now, that means you. Is would they notice us? Would we be missed if we didn't exist? What would it be like to our surrounding community if we didn't exist? If we weren't salt and if we weren't light? You see, it would be really nice if the Crossing Church was known as, and again, I'm talking about the people that make up the church, not the location. But it'd be, not, it'd be nice to know, be known as throughout the community that, you know what, those people there, they're the best people to do business with. Bar none, they are the best. Man, they're, they're teenage kids. They're the kids that I want my kids to run around with. Those teenagers that, that are part of the Crossing Student Ministry, those are the kids I, I feel good about my kids running with. These are the people that are best to emulate. They're the most moral, the most ethical, the most honest, and the most compassionate people I've ever been around. And so if that's what Jesus is like, then I'm listening. See, I'd like to be known as that kind of place, that kind of body. That when people see us, they see things are different, and therefore they see him. They see him. So are you going to make this community brighter? Are you going to make it better? Are you going to make it saltier? I'm excited. I think Rooted is going to be great because the community groups are going to be doing serving together. On Monday nights, we have a thing actually called Light Shine Ministry. Light Shine. That meets over here on Monday nights that you, if you would ever like to come up and volunteer and serve, they're up here every Monday. And I'm sure they would use, they would love to have the help. We have an opportunity to make this community better or you have an opportunity to be average. That's between you and him. So why don't you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for your word. And, and God, there is a lot of encouragement in this word, but there's also a lot of challenge. But that's because this isn't, <laughs> this is not fun and games. People's lives hang in the balance, not, not just physical lives, but more importantly, the spiritual lives of each and every person that makes up humanity hangs in the balance. And, and you have asked us, you have, you have not asked us, you have charged us with the mission of being distinctive, being different, standing out, stepping up. God, I know it's, a, it's so much easier, God, but forgive us for the times that we withdraw from this world and we create our own little subcultures and our own little comfy places. God, forgive us because you want us out of the salt shaker. You want us among the rot and the decay because what we have inside of us is the answer to put a halt to this. And so God, forgive us for the times that we choose comfort, forgive us for the times we choose mediocrity, and forgive us for the times when we settle for average or less. Because when you came into our life, you didn't leave us average, you didn't leave us less, you left us saved, you left us better, you left us good. And that's because of your son, Jesus. I lift this up in his name.